Can you explain to me what the eight biggies of human trauma are that Leonard Orr talks yeah, about? Yeah, yes, Leonard was very brilliant to figure this out. <laughs> and uh, this is one of the first things I learned from him. And uh, the uh, first biggie, of course, is the birth trauma itself. And that includes your conception, your pregnancy, your delivery, postpartum, mm -hmm. and how that affects you. Then the second biggie is specific negative thought structures mm -hmm. and how they affect you. And there's many you learn from right. your family and TV and everything. And then the third biggie is the uh, parental disapproval syndrome. All oh, the disapproval yes. your parents ever got from your grandparents and how that affects them and all the disapproval mm -hmm. you got from them right. and how that affects you and it causes low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Then we have the unconscious death urge. Now we could talk about that for weeks, but that's all okay. the death programming and how that affects you, Absolutely. which is major. Okay, we'll go back to that. <laughs> and then the next one was other lifetimes. And those were the original five biggies. Then he added school trauma, and senility. church trauma, and I think senility, senility trauma. trauma. Yeah. <laughs> and so those are now the eight biggies. And until you work those out, your life cannot really work the way it should. I mean, you might do well, but you could do a lot better if you got rid of those. Absolutely. So and this they is cause really, aging, too, you know. Yeah, it's very important to clear those out of your body. And that's why rebirthing is so valuable, because mm -hmm. you can breathe them out on a cellular level instead right. of having them stuck in your body. Right. Great. So what do you think are the keys to permanent healing? Well, the first step is to understand that the mind rules the body. Mm -hmm. And some people don't understand that. Even when I got a master's degree in medicine and nursing, they never did explain that. Uh, how the mind rules the body. And therefore, according to The Course in Miracles, all illness is mental illness. So mm. everything in your body is caused by a thought. So we would say all pain is the effort involved in clinging to a negative thought. That's what we say in rebirthing. Right. So then all symptoms, it would be the same. All symptoms mm -hmm. are due to um, thoughts that you're clinging to with power. So then disease is just a further escalation of that. You're really clinging to some thought with power when you get a full-blown diagnosis. You mm. know? So hopefully we try to get the person to change their thought the minute they have any symptom. And there's a truth process I developed for figuring out what is the actual cause of your symptom. Oh, I know. This is in your book, Celebration of Breath. It's in the book, uh, Spiritual Healing, um, Healing and Holiness. And it's in there too. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a very powerful process. Do you mm -hmm. want to explain that a little bit? Right. It is in both of those books. This is a process I developed for figuring out what is the real cause of your condition or the real mm -hmm. cause of your symptoms or disease. And it's uh, called the ultimate truth process. And first you write down the negative thoughts I had that caused this condition were. Mm -hmm. And you write them down. And you let go of the thought, I don't know, because if you say, I don't know, you can't access it. Right. Then you write down what you hear in your head, OK? Mm -hmm. um, then the next part is you write down your payoffs uh, for what are you getting out of this condition that's neurotic. And mm -hmm. you have to process that because the Course in Miracles says you won't heal yourself till you're willing to give up your payoffs. Right. So then uh, the last question, which is really important, is my fears of giving up this condition. And people say, well, I don't have any fears of giving up this illness, but they do, otherwise they would have given it exactly. up. So maybe they're getting too many payoffs, and their fear is they wouldn't get attention or love if they gave up the condition, mm -hmm. right? So then you write this all down, and you look at it, and you uh, then you confess it. The second part is you confess it to God or another person. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the third part uh, is you must do spiritual practices or spiritual purification techniques, such as rebirthing, to clear these thoughts. Good. Or chanting or other things, fire ceremonies and so on. Absolutely. Well, Leonard Orr says all symptoms are healings in process. A symptom is either the spirit and mind healing the body or the spirit and body healing the mind. <laughs> wow, that takes a lot to use that, to listen to it. It's, the mind is a tricky thing. Um, so once you said in your book, Healing and Holiness, you had an insidious addiction to suffering. And was this programming from your early religious days? Absolutely, because the church, I belong to a Lutheran church, and you know, they kind of implied that you know, suffering makes you holy. <laughs> yeah, it makes you more <laughs> spiritual. It's kind of the imp implication, and you're supposed to suffer while you're here on earth so that you get all the goodies later. And uh, this makes you addic addicted to suffering. And then you, if you want to be a holy person, you think you're supposed to suffer somehow. You learned mm, that as a kid, even I'm though not it was. 
Yeah. And you might also have a thought, I'm bad, I'm wrong, I'm not worthy of being healed. So Absolutely. that could be your personal lie. So mm -hmm. I'm not good enough to be healed. And mm -hmm. in, in my book, Healing and Holiness, I looked at how all these different personal lies can keep you from healing yourself. Mm. Like you might think, well, I'm not good enough. So I'm not good enough to have a miracle, right? So I'm not good yeah, enough to have a healing. Stuck in it. And therefore circle. I have to keep suffering. And what if I have a thought I'm guilty? Then I'm going to really think I have to suffer. And the church always taught us as kids that we were guilty. We mm. were born sinners. Guilt demands punishment. Mm. So then if I'm guilty, I have to suffer as a form of punishment. Yeah. And so I had to work all that out. Oh my goodness. Well, that's my next question. What does the Course in Miracles say about guilt and anger and all of those negative thoughts well, these, that hold us back? These heavy emotions are really part of our ego. And the ego is a false self that we made up to replace God. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not our real self. No. But it says guilt is not only not of God, it's an attack on God. Mm. And there's only true, true emotions, which are love or fear. So guilt and anger come under the category of fear. But ultimately, if we want to be enlightened, we have to give up all these emotions. And these emotions are spearheaded by thoughts. So if you work on the thought behind the emotion, you can get rid of it. For example, anger. You can find out what is the thought that's causing your anger, and you can drop it and breathe it out. And you can mm -hmm. cure yourself of anger by changing the thought. People don't understand that. And of course, forgiveness helps dissolve everything according to the Course in Miracles. That will help you dissolve all your guilt and your anger. So with anger, we shouldn't suppress it and we shouldn't dump it on people. We should look at the thought and then breathe it out of our bodies and change it into a positive affirmation, correct? Right, because if you suppress it, it'll hurt you. it hurt your body. If you dump it on somebody else, it hurts them and right. that provokes separation. So if you look at the thought that causes the anger, you change the anger, the thought, and then you breathe out the energy you can heal yourself of the anger that way and you're not hurting yourself or anybody else. Good. Yeah, because in our body, each, uh, I think the liver holds on to anger, the pancreas on to rejection, the kidneys is fear. Mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. that takes, uh, each emotion has a different effect on the body. That's really interesting. Yes, and those emotions have a negative effect. Uh, as a nurse, I can tell you, <laughs> like anger spark, spikes the heart rhythm and lowers the immune system for just for starts. Mm. So, what age did you realize that you were a healer? Uh, well, I, I uh, guess I was a healer when I was born in some sense because the, there was a miracle at my birth. Um, ah. So maybe I was a healer many lifetimes. But uh, when my grandfather saw me, um, he didn't go back to the mental institution. He had an acute depression when his son died, my uncle. Oh. And he was in a mental institution for a severe depression. And mm -hmm. they let him out for my birth for some reason. And he saw me and he was instantly healed. And um, so maybe I was a healer already, and I never knew this till I was six. I heard this at a family reunion. They said, shh, don't tell her, like it was mm -hmm. something weird. So I mm -hmm. kind of suppressed it. But I remember now on my tricycle, I used to go around and visit the sick and the poor all the time in the town and take care of them and the old people. And I'm, then when I got to my bicycle, I visited even more people in my little town. So I was uh, kind of always visiting the sick and poor. And then, of course, I went into nursing. So it's kind of been my whole life, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wasn't consciously thinking about it. No, it was just natural. you just naturally do it. Mm -hmm. What has been your most difficult case, you know, as a rebirther and a client? Who, what was the most difficult thing that you had to heal? Uh, with somebody, what was? The oh, I tell you, this this one with the narcolepsy was the hardest of all, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because he kept falling asleep during the rebirth, and you know he he had severe narcolepsy. He um, really would stand up and fall asleep on the stage, or you know giving a speech or anything. Oh and my he goodness! He went to therapists and therapists yeah. forever, and. Uh, the reason it was so hard is because I couldn't keep him awake long enough to get him to breathe out the, the anesthesia. So that's why I finally came up with the idea of a trampoline. And I got him jumping on the trampoline, and I say, breathe, breathe, and he'd jump and jump, and then i say, lie down and breathe, <laughs> and then he'd fall exhausting. asleep again. It was really hard work. Uh, and uh, so You have to be really patient and work through it with him. But he got cured, and, and I was so happy. And what it, what it was is just an overdose of anesthesia. That, mm. that, that was the cause of his narcolepsy, because that, that's the hardest one that comes to my mind. Mm. <laughs> So let's go back to the LRT trainings in the 70s and how, how did you develop that? You were in Theta House, um, then you started creating your own seminars and traveling a lot. 
So yes. how, how did you actually write the training? How did you create okay. that? Okay, uh, as I said, I was starting to keep in my head this data about how people's birth was affecting their relationships. And I had all this data in my head and I was kind of afraid to talk about it because I didn't know uh, how people would handle that. Mm. It was so new, nobody was doing this, no. you know. And then one day Leonard came home and he said, they want you in Hawaii and I told him you're coming, you know. And he never even asked me if I would go. And I guess <laughs> it just pushed me on the road or probably I would have been scared, you know. Yeah. So I went to Hawaii and I'd never done a seminar, but I just shared with people, there's 30 people sitting on the floor and I said, here's what I learned from rebirthing about how your mm -hmm. birth affects relationships. And the day went really fast, and at the end of the day, they're all looking at me with their mouths hanging open. They're going, this explains everything, Sandra. And then they wanted me to stay an extra day and tell all their friends. So I did the whole thing again the next day, and they had the same reaction. They were astonished so it was by resonating. This. They were feeling that this they is right. They knew this was the truth, yeah. this connection about how your birth affects relationships. And so then they said, this is too much to integrate for one day. You have to write this up in a two-day form. Mm -hmm. So I came back to San Francisco and I, I started writing it down in a two-day form. And that was the beginning of the loving relationships training. And it was really great, except for the jealousy section was really hard. I rewrote that 13 times. <laughs> oh my goodness, the jealousy and the incest, the unconscious incest pattern yes. you're talking about. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? That's very sure. important. Yes, and you know, this is often taboo, so uh, I, I felt that it would be unfair to have a training on relationships without covering that because it absolutely affects people's sex lives. And it has to do with uh, when you're young, you you're, you kind of want to be with the parent of the opposite sex, mm -hmm. and you know you can't uh, touch them because it's taboo, and you want to be more with them, and so you get attractive if you're a little girl to your father, and you know right. even Freud wrote about that. Yeah, it's a natural. But then attraction. when you grow up and you get married, if you marry your father, somebody like your father, pretty mm -hmm. soon you can't have sex with them because they become like your father, Absolutely. and it's taboo. And yeah. so this is why a lot of people. Uh, have great sex before they get married and when they get married all of a sudden it just doesn't work and that's because they set up the person as their parent and you can't have sex with your parent. Uh. And these also shows up uh, with people who are in triangles a lot mm -hmm. like if you find yourself attracted to married men or more married women it's trying to get dad away from mom or mom away from mm -hmm. dad. There's and always someone in the way for you receiving right. that love. So if you get involved in triangles that's usually an incest pattern and you know, incest is much more uh, prevalent than you think. And we heard a lot of stories in the LRT over the years. And of course, a lot of it isn't reported. But a lot of it is just emotional incest, not acted out. But that right. still affects a person because it's psychic. It's psychological incest, you know, like mm -hmm. energy. Like I used to have this energy between my father and me, even though he never touched me. It was mm -hmm. emotional incest pattern, mm -hmm. you know. So I was always looking for my father. Right. <laughs> That's interesting. And so the LRT's escalated and you were doing up to 60 trainings in one year and mm -hmm. you went international. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. that was amazing. Yes, and it was very popular all over the world. And then I started going to India and I changed a lot and I started working with the Divine Mother and then um, everything changed. My organization was a bit patriarchal the way I had it set up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then it kind of collapsed and uh, there was a period where the LRT was not going on. And then I got very busy with other newer, new pairs paradigms and so on, teaching new paradigms. But now it's had a revival. It has resurrected yes, itself and great. we've trained new trainers yeah. and it, it's back out in the world and it's it's really important because it, it contains all these patterns about relationships mm -hmm. and it can save you decades of time to take this training. Really Thank decades. God. <laughs> Thank God we have Sandra Ray on this planet <laughs> to help us through and to save us for decades with our relationships. <laughs> Thank oh you. my goodness. And so that must have been difficult yourself when you, you're leading the trainings and being the pioneer and you're going through your own relationship stuff at the same time. Absolutely. In the beginning, uh, the only thing I could do is just tell the total truth. I'd say, today I'm experiencing jealousy and I'm learning this, that, and the other. And I never mm. pretended to have it all figured out, which is why I succeeded. You know, And when I came to San Francisco, I was looking for a training on relationships and there weren't any. And I said, there's all kinds of trainings. What happened to the trainings on relationships? And they said, so everybody's too screwed up in their relationships to teach it. And I said, mm. well, does it have to be me then? And you know, I just saw a need and I filled it. 
And because I had all this information about birth and relationships, I was a natural for doing it. And uh, the thing is, when I would go through my own case, I would just confess it to everybody because everyone's telepathic. They would know anyway. So I, I always told the truth, and that seemed to work, and I still do that. Because you never can learn enough about relationships. No, and we learn what we need. To, we teach what we need to Absolutely. learn as well. 